So I'm joined by two very special guests today. First up, we're joined by a London-born, Kent-based producer, ADMB. And alongside him, we also have Swedish producer, Bukas. Both prolific producer musicians in their own right, they've recently come together for a new collaborative EP called Dreams in Colour, which is out right now on Rotterdam-based label Endless Sunday. Uh, thank you so much to both of you for joining me. It's an honor to have you on. Um, first and foremost, how are you both doing? How's it going? I'm good. We're good. The sun is shining. It's beautiful weather. Can't complain. Perfect. Yeah, thanks for having us, mate. Yeah, same. We're having a bit of a, well, as you know, Luke, we're having a bit of a heat wave in, in London at the moment. So it's uh, it's warm. But I'm not complaining. No. Yeah, yeah we've got to, got to embrace this weather when we get it every so often. Um, so for this first part of the interview, yeah, I wanted to get into your influences and how you got into music, um, what you were listening to when you were younger. So I'm guess growing up in the UK and growing up in Sweden, um, you must both have really different musical influences. Um, what sort of stuff were you guys hearing in your house when you were growing up? You want to go first, Dee? Yeah, I can. Uh, well, uh, my dad is from Greece and my mom's from Finland. So I grew up with a lot of like Greek folk music. Uh, but they were also like really into reggae music. Uh, so it was like a mix of genres in my house. So I got into like reggae music when I was really young. Uh, so yeah, a bit like of everything, I'd say. Yeah. And then my, nice. my brother introduced me to hip hop. So I, yeah, that's pretty much how I would like. That's the kind of music that was playing in my house. Nice. And for you? Yeah. So I, I mean, I'm old, so I grew up in the 80s. Um, and my 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 mum like was really into music. We always had a lot of like sort of Motown and, and jazz and stuff like that playing in the house. And she was like really into like artists like Sade and you know a lot of the old school sort of soul stuff. But um, because of that time period as well, that sort of mid to late 80s, um, I was listening to a lot of bands as well, like um, the Smiths and the Cure and, and that sort of stuff. So, but I, I would definitely say that kind of R&B, soul, jazz was was the first, my sort of earliest memories of like really listening to music and really starting to develop a, a passion for it, you know? Sure. And I suppose it sounds like for both of you, you, you both had kind of, yeah, very diverse musical upbringings. Were, were you living in like musical households? Were you encouraged to play instruments and stuff from a young age or anything like that? I wasn't, no, not at all. I, you know, I, no, not at all. There is no one, uh, there is no one musical in my family whatsoever. So we, like everybody loved listening to music. It was always on. Sure. It was very much a part of the, the fabric of our, of our home. But no, it was, uh, I don't think I picked up a musical instrument until like my late teens, really. Oh, wow. And for you, Luca? Uh Well, my mom used to sing when she was younger. So like she was singing all the time for me and uh, I was really into singing when I was young uh, and then they bought like a guitar so I was just playing around but I don't know how to play guitar and I couldn't by then. So uh, <laughs> like uh, yeah I just like to <laughs> make noise pretty much but I wouldn't say that my family is that musical in a sense right. like nobody creates music except me and uh, they don't play music anymore so sure. so yeah i was a little bit of the black cheap or what do you call it <laughs> what um adam what was what was the first instrument then that you got your hands on in your teens that's a good question it, it would have been it would have been bass it was bass guitar i was playing with a buddy of mine who was um I, I was i was starting to get into production and i, I was sure. working with a with a dj at the time and i, I was learning about kind of the basics of, of production and, and that was that was hip-hop production at the time but at the same time, I was sort of starting to mess around with like this idea of playing in bands. And I was playing with a, a pal of mine who was a guitarist and he literally just gave me this sort of rickety old bass that he had kicking around and was teaching me like really ba basic bass lines, you know? Um, yeah, so that's that's probably my, that was my entry to, to actually starting to play anything live, you know? Sure. And I, I always find it interesting to ask people, what was the, um, obviously, when you're growing up, you, you're taking in like your parents' uh, music and whoever's whoever's around. Um, what's like the first 
either the first thing that you remember buying yourself or like the first type of music mm-hmm. that, you, that you kind of discovered on your own and, and that became like the thing that you, you loved? Well, for me, it was actually like uh, very random, but uh, I got some money from my grandpa and I went into the store and I bought like a Kiss CD. I think it was the one called Psychedelic Circus, the one with the 3D covers. I think that was the reason why it caught my attention. Yeah. I never had you down as a Kiss kiss fan, Dennis. (laughs) I'm learning new things about you all the time. Oh, man. (laughs) (laughs) That's very, like, uh, well hidden in my background. (laughs) But yeah, that was the first one. I think for me, like, uh, uh, honestly, I I can't really remember, but the, the... the main one I remember was, and I remember hiding it from my parents at the time. So it was probably about what ninety five it came out. I bought the uh, the Slim Shady LP okay. uh, on CD because like my my mates were talking about it in school, and I remember like getting home and playing it and just like, oh my god, my parents can't can't hear this. This is this is terrible. <laughs> so I kind of kept it hidden. So that was like my first, I suppose, me discovering new music. You know, my own world that they they didn't know anything about. You know, and it was. Um, it was crazy. I was pretty obsessed with that record for a while, to be fair. Sure. And then, and then from that point, from like discovering your own stuff, um, how much further along was it that you then started kind of getting interested in like making your own music, producing, and, and was there like a a certain point in time, like when you heard a track or something that that like kind of piqued your interest in that? Or uh, well, for me, like uh, when I was about twelve years old. My brother bought me like, um, it's a CD called The Chronicle (laughs) by Dr. Dre. It's not The Chronic, it's The Chronicle, which is like a greatest hits type of uh, record. And when he bought that to me, like I was, I I got obsessed by it. So I started to write my own lyrics. So I was about like 12, 13 when I started to write lyrics. And that's when I got into like making music in a way. Uh, So were you rapping first then? Yeah, exactly. But then like after two years, I started to produce him because like (laughs) I was pretty bad at it. So nobody wants to give me beats. (laughs) So I had to make them by myself. So if we were to search deep on the internet, could we find some of these old raps from you? Or is there nothing that got released at all? Well, (laughs) there is. It's around. (laughs) Yeah, it's around. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man. Yeah. But I was really, I I got really into like uh, rapping was my main thing. Sure. Nice. Definitely. So it's kind of Dr. Dre that kind of put you on that path then. Yeah, definitely. And my brother, because he bought me that CD and then sure. like straight away I bought like, uh, I think it was around when uh, 50 Cent dropped his album, Get Rich or Die Trying. Yeah. And then nice. after that, I started to go to like libraries and uh, you could like uh, borrow CDs from them. And they had like underground Swedish rap and things like that. <laughs> so I got really like into into the rap and hardcore rap scene, I would say. Nice. And Adam, for you? Yeah, I think um, in a way kind of similar to Dennis, actually. I mean, I, I, I was listening to, you know, going back to talking about like the Slim Shady LP for quite a while, my introduction to hip hop was, was all American hip hop, like it probably was for most most young guys in the UK at the time. But I think like late 90s, early no- noughties, I started to discover the sort of the UK hip hop scene. Like it had already been there like way before me, but, um, and I was, I was introduced to a lot of, um, you know, the, the beats that were coming out. Like I'm thinking of like producers like Harry Love at the time that was producing beats like Jest and, and stuff like that. And that whole, um, you know, like DJ Disorder, the stuff that he was playing and that I was getting introduced to. I was, I was hearing these beats and I was, I was like, this kind of sounds more homegrown. It, you know, if I was to mm-hmm. go and make, music at that time I would have just been trying to replicate what they were doing in the states and it wouldn't it wouldn't have worked you know and then hearing that stuff it was like oh like you know the, these guys that are rapping you know they've got the same accent as me and they're talking about places that I know and I've been to and I've grown up in and um, it made it a lot more like relatable so yeah at that time it was probably those sort of beats that I was hearing and started to think maybe maybe this is something that I could I could get involved with you know sure and at, at that point like from from like getting interested and in starting to learn how to produce and stuff, um, how long further the line um, did it take you to then start putting out your mu- own music? Were you guys were you guys working with other artists, rappers and singers and stuff, or did you just 
go straight away and start putting instrumental stuff out yourselves? Well, um, I I was working with like I got to know a lot of people in the rap scene here in Stockholm, and uh, there was like a community web page which was like a very big part of the Swedish like music scene, especially for hip hop. Uh, so it was like we were having like audio battles against each other, like people taught each other how to produce, etc. So I started to get like connected with people around here in Stockholm. We started to meet up and uh, do music together. So I started to release rap music when I was around like 16, I'd say. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Something like that. And how about for you, Adam? Yeah, I was. I've always been a bit of a late bloomer, to be honest. <laughs> like, you know, so I, I was really sort of um, diving into that whole UK hip hop scene. But I, I was more enjoying it as like a fan of it than just listening sure. to it. You know, it was, it was at a time in my life when I was first starting to go out with the boys, and we were hitting pubs and bars or whatever. So it was more like a soundtrack to that to that period of my life. But I, I would say probably in my like late teens, um, it was when I started to think, you know, maybe I could could start making my own stuff but i was spending a lot of time with uh, a dj at the time uh, a producer at the time as well uh, dj mentat so um big up dj mentat if he ever gets to hear this i've not spoke to that dude in like 20 years um <laughs> and he was amazing and he, he was like just just showing me around the studio and, and how to make beats you know and yeah so it was probably about yeah late teens that I, I first sat down and started to piece together my own sounds and ideas and start to mess around with the idea of of producing really. sure and what at that time when you when you first started making music what sort of like gear were you using what was it like um, in the studio there I'm guessing it was like a not you couldn't just do it straight up, just on a laptop well for me I, I'm uh, I'm 32 so okay like uh, uh, people like we had PCs at home yeah so I started making music in uh, Sony Acid Pro oh yeah which I is, yeah Classic. Yeah. Oh man, classic. <laughs> <laughs> so I started to make beats there and then uh, Fruity Loops as well. Uh, but I was more into like uh, Sony Acid Pro because I really enjoyed sampling music and Fruity Loops wasn't so great at it uh, at the time. And then uh, I started with Reason as well. Uh, and they had this like rewire function which made it possible to connect softwares together and have one master software and one slave. So, so yeah, I started to get like very experimental with the computers, etc. So I, yeah, I was straight up PC in the beginning. Nice. And for you, Adam? Yeah, I mean, as I say, I, I'm old. So, <laughs> so like when I look back to when we, like I think back to when I was hanging out with DJ Mentat and he was making beats. He he was using. Um, do you remember on the PlayStation One there was that game called Music? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he sort of like. I mean, what he did actually looking back now was incredible. He kind of like hacked it, you know, and he was able to use it. He, he was, and he was kind of, um, he was using it for like sampling and he, he was sampling direct from vinyl into it and stuff. And it was like a really complicated way of working looking back. And it was pretty amazing, like some of the, some of the sounds that he got from it. So that was my first sort of introduction to it. And then I think when I got my first PC, there was a, I don't know if you remember, there was this like CD series that came out. It was called like DJ, like DJ A Y, I think. And it, w it was like a really terrible like door with like these awful loops, you know. And uh, I used to just sort of layer them and make these terrible, terrible beats. But it was it was great because I started to learn about sequencing and, and layering and do you know what I mean? Like the, the process of it. Um, and then I think from there, my first like proper like audio workstation would, would have been Cubase. So I worked with that for sure. a little bit. Uh, and then I came away from it for quite a while and eventually when I came back I came back to Logic but yeah it was um, I mean it was it was all pre-analog back then wasn't it so you know it was yeah. like working with what you had you know for sure yeah no I remember actually that software that DJ software um, using that at school um, yeah that was great fun yeah that was my first introduction to any of it um, wow. every every music lesson just going straight onto the computer and be like oh, okay let's get on let's Pull some loops in, make it song. <laughs> yeah, yeah no, that's some good stuff. Um, but yeah, now I want to I, I want to kind of move a little bit over to like kind of talk about the project that you guys have put out. By the time this interview go, goes out, um, the EP will be out. Dreams in color. Uh, I wanted to ask you a few more like production specific based questions and just find out about the process of of making the EP all together. Um, 
So first of all, how did this link up come about? How did you guys first get introduced? Well, we had like a beat show in uh, London. It was in 2018, wasn't it? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, it was, yeah, yeah. so it was like a Beat Lab versus 9 to 5, which is like a, a label that we both were a part of. Like we were mm. releasing music with them. And so we met up in London at this beat gig uh, where we were playing like uh, beats live and just hanging around with very good people. And uh, yeah, me and Adam started to talk and we like really resonant with different like each other's philo- philosophies regarding music. So that's when we started to talk and like we both were very impressed by the music that uh, yes, yeah, so I was impressed by the music that Adam was making and sure. vice versa and yeah so that's how i remember that it got started yeah it was it was um it was at that beat me thing wasn't it which was which was organized by um by our friend chris dj busy fingers rest in peace uh busy oh, yeah. um yeah, at, at the time you know and, and chris you know what a legend man and he, he set up this event um and i i was on the nine to five roster um, and, and Dennis was as well. You've been on it, for, I think, quite a lot longer than me since pretty much since it started, if I'm not mistaken. Um, since 2016. Oh, okay, fine. So, yeah, it's a similar sort of time then. And um, so we were all like label mates in a way, but obviously we were sure. all dotted around dotted around Europe. But that was like the first time we actually got to meet in person. And um, it, what was really cool about that as well was that like you, you had some people doing like traditional sort of uh, like DJ sets. And then Dennis, you did a set. You were using the machine, if I'm not mistaken, at the time. And it was—he was like you were layering sort of, you know, loops and stuff like that from an album that you're working on. And it was—it just really, really caught my ear because it, it was this kind of sound that I, I was doing probably a bit more straightforward. Like I suppose now you would call it like chill hop, lo-fi, whatever, instrumental hip hop. And Dennis was really bringing in this like really melodic, you know, ambient, atmospheric stuff. And it, and it just it kind of blew my mind at the time and I was like yeah I want to hear hear more of this and you know I didn't expect necessarily that we would work together I just wanted to understand his Dennis's processes and and how he was working and sort of naturally we ended up we ended up working together I think your your album the setting came out that year was that 2018 and I, I, I was on a track on that which was the first thing I think we did yeah exactly yeah exactly so 2018 I think that was in the beginning of the year that we met up in uh, in the UK, I think it was in February, and then I released yeah. like the album in June, I think. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Nice. Yeah, yeah. No. Shout, yeah, shout out to um, Busy Fingers for those beat me. I only, I only went to one of them, and I yeah DJ'd at one of those. But yeah, no, those are incredible. Great, great place to like meet people um, and love them like-minded artists for sure. Um, yeah. From from that point, uh, so when you guys met and then I guess you collabed on, on your album, um, how come you decided to come together to, to create a, a full project? How did that come about? So like a year after my release, Adam invited me to come to London to visit okay. him. And uh, no, it was the same year, actually. So uh, we met each other in February and I came to London in December. And... Uh, yeah, we just had a few days when we were just sitting at his brother's house making music, and uh, and yeah, it was uh, it was a fun way of working because we were seeing music from different perspective, obviously, but uh, we could connect in a in a certain sound, and I f- I thought that was very interesting. So that's when it started, uh, like to be a collaborative. Uh, process I reckon because the first one I made like on my album I made a demo and Adam laid some things on top of it sent it back I mixed it and then it was ready but during the process in December we started to like give each other feedback in a different way and uh, start to be more involved in the songs I'd say sure and uh, am I right in in saying that um when you first started making it, you were you were sending ideas back and forward, or you were working on stuff, but then you decided to re-record the whole thing live. Is that right? Yeah. So, I mean, I don't really remember that the first time we kind of said let's make a an EP or an album or a project. I think we were just 
we were just sending music you know we were just working on songs really sure and um and this was uh probably just pre-pandemic i think at, at the time and um and then and then the pandemic started and then we were like stuck at home and couldn't you know couldn't do anything so we were we were sending stems back and forth which was which was our usual way of working obviously if we're not in the studio together um and then i think it was dennis had just put out uh an ep i can't remember when it was called ataraxia did i get the pronunciation right dennis well done um (laughs) And he brought in some some more live elements. I think Philip was playing the bass on that, wasn't he? And and I was like, this is amazing. Like, what? Tell me, what is this thing? Like, how how you know what's the process here? And um, when we probably got a little bit more into to the project, and we maybe had like say three or four like working demos, Dennis sort of had the idea of like, well, you know, what if we just re-recorded? Like, when we can travel again, what if we just got in a studio? got some session musicians and and these amazing guys which i'm sure we'll talk about that, that dennis knows um what if we just get together and re-record the entire thing live um and then that became like the working that became the goal you know so we were we were working on the track sending stuff back and forth knowing that it was all going to be re-recorded um and it was all going to be you know re you know retracked um and then it then that was the that was the uh the end goal and that's what we were working towards um, and then obviously restrictions lifted and we were able to to get in the studio and get it done. Nice. And do, do you want to talk a little bit about that that process then of um, taking those, so these demos or the ideas that you had and then re-recording them? How did, how did you go about doing that? Well, I, I because I, I was studying at the moment, uh, so I was studying music and sound production and that's how I met Anton, which plays like uh, keys and uh, drums on the whole uh, record and some of the percussions and synths as well. He's amazing. Uh, but yeah, so Anton, uh, we started to work a little bit together. Like I was making loops and then we went into the studio together and he played the chords and made it more interesting. So that was our first like process, how we started to work. And then with this project with Adam, I'd say we we started to make demos and uh, like have a complete arrangement and then we started to talk about the sound like what sound do we want to go for uh, what kind of key instruments we would like to have and uh, yeah how, how how should we put this together so like we were having a lot of discussions before we met up in the studio to just have everything like prepared because we only had two days in the studio so we wanted to make everything like uh, to be on schedule, uh, and yeah. So uh, so we started to like form arrangements, have uh, sounds. Okay, so when should we do like a switch up, uh, etc. Uh, yeah, sure. and was was it all like um, the, what you hear on on the record now? Is it all like live, or we, did you take different takes and stuff and and, and spice it all together, or are they all completely live tracks? I would say most of them are live tracks, uh, but then we had to, because I weren't happy with the drums on Let Go when we first had the session, and uh, then we re-recorded the drums on Let Go uh, at a different time. And the same with the song Transition, because that song was written in the studio. Uh, so because we were trying to work on another track, but it didn't like it didn't feel right for any of us. So yeah. we were like, okay, you guys start to jam, uh, like Anton and Philip, and they came up with this amazing idea, and then we started to work on it. But uh, so we re-recorded the drums on that track as well, uh, and then synths as well, because uh, we, uh, me and Anton went into my uni because they had the Uno 60, so we wanted to have like uh, synths from a Uno 60 on top of it. So, but I would say. Like seventy percent of the tracks were recorded during that session, I'd say. Sure. What do you think, Adam? Yeah, yeah, com- completely agree with you. Yeah, it, it was. I mean, the, the the transition song was pretty interesting because, like you say, we had an, we had another song that we were going to work on, and and actually at the time that was my favorite track on the EP as well. <laughs> so it was quite a hard decision because we were working on it. And I think we, me and Dennis both at the same time had the realization of like, we're kind of forcing this, we're trying to make this work. And it's, sure. I don't know what it was, but it, it just didn't translate, did it? Live with the with the instruments and stuff. So it was one of those moments where we knew we only had a limited time with the with, with Anton and Philip. 
So it was like, we want to use this time. And it was quite late in the day, I think, D, if I'm not mistaken. So we didn't have that much time before I think I had to leave and get a flight home. And we just were like, do you know what? Let's just like jam something. So it, for a little split second in time, we were, we were all in a band together and we just sat there and, and wrote a song. And obviously we had to do a bit more work on that track after the sessions because we could only record so much. So that needed a li- little bit more work. But the others, I'd say, um, were pretty much done. It was it was it was then about the the mixing side and you know and all the other ele- you know there were some extra layers and elements that Dennis added um, after the sessions as well. And the Imran no. as well because and he Imran, was yeah, in the course, studio. Yeah, yeah. No, nice. big up street rap. And how um, was it all recorded before before you linked up with Endless Sunday? How did that um, link up come together? Did you already have the project? Yeah. So. We, we had this idea, um, so we, we finished, we recorded it, what was it? It was last February 2022, and then Dennis spent a lot of time on the mix, you know, a lot of time, like crazy crazy hours <laughs> mixing the thing. And then I um, came back to Gothenburg this January, um, and then we went over to the studio. I'll let Dennis talk more about the master inside, but I came over for, you know, just to sort of be a part of it really, I, you know, just to sort of understand the process because mastering isn't, obviously isn't my background. Sure. Um, and um, yeah, and then once that was done, the idea was we wanted to kind of, you know, put together a bit of a package. So we put, we, we got a lot of filming done in the studio. Um, so we put together a little like short video, like an, an EPK uh, video. And then we um, and then we went and pitched it to the label. So we went to them actually with a fully finished, mastered project. Um, with a cover as to, well. With artwork, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, again, shout, shout out Luke, Luke Wilding, um, who's uh, you, you know a, a family member of mine. Like he he did the artwork, which he he did all you know from scratch. So we we went to him with a full package, didn't we? Really, and we're able to present it as as a you know with a with a bow a bow on top kind of thing <laughs> and uh yeah so it, it was quite nice to present it in that way but we, we wanted to make it as professional as we could you know sure and, and whereabouts did the the name come from dreams in color i'll let you talk about that adam because yeah <laughs> uh I, yeah, i don't know it just it, it just came came to us one day you know we um we we don't i, I mean when we when we work together we don't tend to put too much emphasis on like track names or a story or a concept do we it's more about the sound and it's it's more about the vibe and then i think when um as it was all progressing like i mean i'm so bored of talking about the pandemic i really try not to do it because it's just <laughs> it's just so no one wants to hear about it and nobody wants to talk about it but you can't we can't deny that it you know it, it definitely influenced you know the project and and you know and, and our mood and our feelings at the time and you know we were all like everybody was right frustrated um fed up and, and you know just uh f- feeling very sort of uh, a bit downcast and and you know everything just felt a bit gray so we kind of uh, and when we were making the tracks like literally the sound to us it sounded colorful it was playful you know there was a lot of um like yeah so we then had this idea that it's almost like uh a liberation from you know this kind of stagnant lifestyle that we've been living and, and then you know maybe if you you know want to get a bit cheesy and, and cliche with it it was kind of playing into you know responsibilities of being older having a job you know be, you know like i have a career outside of music and sometimes that can be frustrating to me so it was like uh, an escapism and i think that's that's where the uh that's where the concept kind of came from and then it But it, we didn't really sit down at any point, if, if I'm not mistaken, D, I don't think we ever sat down and had like a deep conversation and put all this thought and meaning in it. It, it just came together pretty naturally. And it was like, ah, oh, dreams and color, that that just works. It just, you know, sure. that's 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 the sound. It, like listening to it, it. Yeah, it's very bright. It sounds like that to me. And it's like kind of like psychedelic dreamy sort of thing. So yeah, I think, I think the name suits it really for sure. Definitely, and to be honest, like the, our demos were pretty moody. Okay. Like if we go yeah. back to them, it was a lot of like minor chord progressions, etc. But then Anton is such a happy guy, and he always <laughs> translate the moodiness into more colorful. I would say, like it it can start pretty moody, but then it end up being more brighter in the sure. way that he does with the voicing, etc. Uh, so that also like uh, changed the concept of the record, I'd say. 
Okay. But we had a few, we had a few like meetings on Zoom. I know when we were talking about like what's the concept, where we're coming from, and uh, we Adam started to talk about this video idea of a person like uh, it's black and white, but then suddenly like it starts to add color into the world, and he starts to become to a dreamy place. Uh, so yeah, there is a concept because uh, from the start to the finish, I think you can say talk about that, Adam, because that was uh, yeah, you mean like the where the names come from because it has a story, it's a start and an ending, in a way. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think yeah. I mean, if you if you follow the like the the track titles, it's it's kind of like uh, it's a bit of like a liberation kind of thing, you know, and and if and. And whoever you know, if you, if you say the album is maybe around like a character that you're following through the songs, at the beginning of it, this character is you know stuck, trapped, and then first track is let go, you know, and then, and I just kept like the the second track, the second single, the tourist. Um, in my mind, the, the, where the tourist came from, it just got me thinking about the amount of time I spend on tubes in the, in the underground in London, you know, for for work, which I'm about to do after this, ironically. Um, and you know just sometimes just feeling a bit like a tourist in, in your own life and, and everything that's going around you and then it was like just an escapism from that and then you know transition was into a you know transition into something better and something more free and then the final track which was you know ad astra which you know a little you know probably a pretty uh, overused uh phrase maybe but you know to the stars it was like anything's possible like you, you can you can shed these things that are kind of holding you back from from doing what you want to do and maybe living the life that you want to have, and and that's true for me personally. Not to be kind of too uh, deep with it, but that's true for me sort of musically as well during this process. Because at the start of it, I was feeling so frustrated with with the pandemic and with um, you know the restrictions placed on me from a musical perspective, and I wasn't really sure where I was going anyway at that time. And then this project was so liberating for me, and then and then to be able to to get in the studio and, and work with these guys and and see these tracks come to life was was uh, was really amazing. It was kind of like it was pretty emotional for me actually. Like the first day in the studio, um, it kind of hit me. It was like it all hit me in, in one in one moment. Um, but yeah, that was the that was the the thought process behind that. Anyway, sure. Yeah, yeah that sounds sounds amazing. And. Um... One thing I thought uh, when, when listening to the project is, like, I need this needs to be played out live. Do you do you guys have any plans to to put on a live show of it at all? I know it kind of it must be difficult with people being all over the place, but we we, we want to for sure. Like, we would love to. And one of the very first conversations with uh, with uh, with Endless Sunday was they they had the same idea, the same suggestion. Um, I mean, I, I agree with you. I think it, it you know, it, it kind of begs to be played live. What what that will look like, I'm not sure, um, because yeah, we've got musicians all over the place and everything else. But um, in my mind, it, it will happen. Um, when, how, everything else, like that's yet to be figured out. But um, sure. I kind of feel like it has to, it has to happen. So yeah. I think it's fingers crossed. You, you agree, Dennis? <laughs> yeah, definitely. And uh, but the issue with this is, uh, well, it's not an issue. It became like a concept. But uh, because Anton plays both keys and drums, we have to sort uh, okay. that out. So we have <laughs> to take uh, another musicians into the project. But we've been thinking about it as like Dreams in Color could be like a collective type of thing where we introduce more musicians throughout the process and uh, like for an upcoming uh, project that yeah we would uh, like uh, yeah introduce more musicians into it and uh, so yeah we're in that process of like finding the right persons etc and uh, be able to rehearse and, and yeah so it's about a, a lot of logistics I'd say yeah, for sure and so I'm guessing there's there's more music lined up then you guys have already been working on new stuff I'll let you take that one, D. <laughs> yeah, we are. Yeah, we're working on new stuffs. Uh, currently, I'm just doing a remix for Adastra. Uh, so I'm just uh, finishing that one up. It's also with the uh, session musicians, but it's more like a house type of vibe, I would say. Oh, nice. 
yeah it's pretty it's pretty dope like uh, i'm working with a jazz pianist and uh, also a guy on saxophone uh so it's very like live and dreamy but yeah but after that we're gonna continue on a few tracks that we've been working on so we recorded some roads in uh, when we were visiting uh, bastian and endless sunday in rotterdam sure so we we went into the studio and kept on working on a few tracks so we got we got more things coming up definitely oh, nice i'm excited excited to hear what's coming um before i let you both go i know you're probably really busy today i just had a couple of like quick hit questions kind of more producer based stuff and um, what um what doors are you both using what do you both work on logic logic yeah great choice yeah <laughs> Yeah, I use. I, uh, oh, sorry, man. Oh. That's all right, mate. I, I I messed around with Ableton for a little while a few years ago. Um, I, I really like a lot of the stock plugins on Ableton, um, which I found pretty cool. And sometimes I'll jump back into that just for the odd thing. Um, sure. But I, I'm just so used to working with Logic now. Just the workflow for me, just it, it suits my style. And I'm um, I'm actually not a very techie guy, to be honest with you. Dennis will probably. 100% back that up <laughs> but um, you know I'm trying I'm trying to improve but um, yeah Logic is kind of even a even a, a, a yeah an old school head like me can figure it out and, and, and sure. eke some kind of music out of it you know? yeah yeah so like when I started I said I started with the PC to make music but then I went into like MPCs okay. uh, so I was really heavy into like beat making in MPCs but nowadays I use machine and then sure. connect it with Logic. So I do all the mixing and production in Logic, but I do like the basic writing on machine because like I want to play the drums and etc. with my hands and to get like that human feel. So sure. machine and Logic together. Nice, both on Logic, yeah. That's it's good to hear. Everyone's <laughs> on Ableton these days, I'm sure. Um, yeah. And then do you guys have like a favorite plugin is there any plugin at all that you use on pretty much everything at all yeah uh, <laughs> i use uh, one by softube called called tape echoes oh yeah i know yeah uh it's like a, a classic tape echo and it's amazing um uh, yeah so that's my go-to plugin i use it on pretty much everything <laughs> i'd say even if i don't use the echo I can use it as a because you can drive the signals so you can get like a really greedy sound on the drums etc and yeah so tape echoes on everything yeah I kind of bounce around from stuff quite a lot but Dennis introduced me to uh, Valhalla um, a few years back and I, I, I now I'm at a point where I use it too much I need to scale it back <laughs> a bit but I, I love that plugin yeah so yeah the I'm super massive one yeah it's so good it's so good it just makes everything sound big it just gives that space to everything um yeah so that's and it's it was free i think if i remember correctly as well so yeah can't go wrong nice and if uh this is a question i really like to ask people if you could um executive produce an album for one artist in the world um who are you choosing i probably would have said uh mac miller back in the day I would, I would love to have worked with him. Um, but I, I would say now, um, might be a bit of a surprising one, but uh, Jesse Ware probably actually. I, I really have really enjoyed following her career, like the first stuff where it was kind of that like old school soul, Sade sort of sound, and then now she's yeah. doing like straight up like disco and house. But I just think she's got a, a truly unique and amazing voice. And I, I really do like to work with singers where I can. And um She's an artist that I always hear and just think, oh, I'd love to produce some tracks for her, you know? So yeah, if I think about it, there's probably more, but you know. Sure. I remember yeah. her, yeah, when I first heard her her stuff of like Disclosure back in the day. Yeah. And her voice yeah. is, yeah, it's absolutely incredible, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's like a real, like one of the, you know, almost like, you know, the old time greats, you know, she, she's got that sort of level to her voice, but she just makes really, really tight pop music. And I love that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so. Nice, so maybe, maybe one day hear a, hear a pop album from you <laughs> in the future then. You never know. You never know. <laughs> Dennis on vocals, you know, we'll see. <laughs> oh, shit. And how about for yeah, you? Ooh. Like, I'm a really big, like, dub reggae head. 
Uh, so I would love to go into the studio if I could with King Tubby and the Aggravators. Okay. Uh, King Tubby, rest in peace. That would be amazing to share the process. But um, I don't. I don't know. So much good music that I want to get my hands on, you know. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, it would be great to work with like Joseph Days or Alchemist oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. or that kind of thing and be be in the process from the beginning to experiment with the sound etc that would be yeah. amazing for sure um, yeah. yeah i'm sure you could learn yeah a lot i, I saw the new um use of days he's got his new album coming out hasn't he so yeah just, uh, there was that video of him at the royal albert hall playing drums which looks crazy <laughs> is that uh, is that where you with rocco rocco paladino on the bass as well yeah i think this video one? That was just here. Yeah, there's, right. there's a lot of stuff with those. Oh, I've not yeah, seen that then. I need crazy. to check that out. I've not seen that. I think it was promo. For, I think he's got a show coming up at Royal Albert Hall later in the year. So it's yeah. a promo video for that. Yeah, I want to try and get to that show if I can get tickets for sure. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, those guys, Alpha Mist, uh, Yusuf Daisy, incredible. Yeah, for sure. Um, but yeah, like I said, I don't want to take too much of your time. I know you said you got work after this. Um, oh, it's all good no rush thanks to both of you guys for, for coming on the show um, guys make sure you check out the new EP which will be out by the time this drops um, Dreams in Colour it's on streaming platforms everywhere now would you guys like to add anything at all? I think that's everything for me just thank you for having us and thank you for you know all the support we've we've had for the record so far you know we've had some, some really amazing um, support on the first couple of singles and yeah, it's a special record to us, so it means a lot. So, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, and thanks for having us and be able to talk a little bit about the process, etc. Et yeah, yeah, again, thanks for, thanks for coming on. And uh, I'll be looking forward to that pop album from you in the, in the future. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, also those collaborations with Yusuf, Yusuf Days as well. 